Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're uh, very lucky to be joined by Bill Botke, who's come across to us from Colorado, uh, where he's at the Southwest Research Institute. Uh, Bill got his uh, Bachelor of Science from the University of Minnesota, which I'm sure you'll no doubt detect in his accent. <laughs> and he did a PhD at uh, the University of Arizona, uh, where his uh, love for asteroids started. He has spent a career uh, looking at the dynamics, collisions, and uh, um, uh, different bodies of asteroids uh, throughout our solar system. Uh, today he's going to talk to us on uh, a new topic to him, uh, which is uh, more related to the Earth uh, and uh, uh, is about the uh, Archean um, bombardment. In fact, he's going to talk to us about the implications of, uh, uh, the, of findings uh, for the great Archean bombardment. So if you'll Join me in welcoming Bill. Oh. Well, thank you very much. It's a real, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've never, I've never been to SETI, so this is fun to, to see where you guys live and the whole thing. I also, uh, I was also excited by this talk because in the process of agreeing to do this, I found out you archive your talks, and I saw Don Lowe's talk from about six months ago. And he had some great stuff in there. And so I'm going to try to address many of the questions that his, his talk raised from a few months ago. But I'm not going to do that to the end. I have to tell something of a story to get to there. I should also point out, in one of the other hats I wear is I'm actually the director of one of the NASA's lunar, uh, lunar Science Institutes. I run one in Boulder called the Center for Lunar Origin and Evolution. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is related to the moon. But you know, the moon is uh, Earth's best friend. right? So we're going to be talking about both these together and saying a lot about how we can use the moon and the other constraints we have in the solar system to tell us about how planet formation worked and some of the things you may not know about planet formation and how all this ties into the bombardment history of these worlds. Okay, so maybe a more a less provocative title. I wanted to make sure I got a good audience. So I wanted to bring you that title. But I'm going to talk a lot about the end of accretion on the moon and the earth and talk about something we call the late heaven bombardment. And I'll be defining all these terms as we go along. So. So, but I wanted to start a little bit with a little bit of motivation here because I run a lunar institute and I'm actually right now at the Lunar Science Forum, which is just over at NASA Ames. And over the last few years, you know, there's been lots of talk about going to the moon and then we're not going to go to the moon and maybe we'll go back to the moon, you know, who knows what's going on. But I just want to point out that give you some motivation as for why I, why I like doing this, right? So I was born in 1966, so I'm just old enough to remember like the last few Apollo landings. And this is back for the young people in the audience. This is back when we had four television channels, all four, and all of them were covering you know, the, the lunar landings. And when I was a kid watching this, I thought this was amazing, right? We had humans going to another world, they're bringing back samples, they're exploring it, we're learning about neighbors, we're learning about planet formation, and I thought this is what I want to do for my life. That probably set the course for my career. And since that time, it's been a little disappointing to see that the moon has become something of a been there, done that place for a lot of people. Okay. And so from my perspective as running a lunar institute, I think I have to deal with a big picture problem and that the public has almost no idea about why we should go back to the moon from a science perspective. Okay. Now I'm not going to deal with all the other issues with economics and the rest, but from a science perspective, people don't know why the moon is interesting. And I would argue many planetary scientists, maybe just many scientists in general, have the same problem. So I'm going to try to deal with that in this talk today. And hopefully I'll get you excited by the end to see why the moon is an interesting place. So the moon itself is fascinating. It's just an interesting world intrinsically. But also, if you can understand the properties of the moon, you can use it like a Rosetta Stone. And it can tell you like, about the unknown nature of the primordial Earth, where there's almost no information about the first half billion years of Earth's history, okay, and even beyond. And also, the moon can be used to tell you about the critical last stages of planet formation throughout the solar system. And both those are fundamental to our understanding of how the solar system has evolved. All right, so let's see if I can get this right. Okay. So why, do we, so why is the moon interesting from my perspective? It's because it has almost the, com, it has the most complete and, complier, and com, excuse me, complete and clear impact history available of the last four and a half billion years of solar system evolution. It's also the most accessible from our standpoint. So we can use this to constrain our planet formation models. And I'll be talking a lot about that as we go on today. Okay? So, but to set up all this problem, I want to tell you a story. So once upon a time, we want to talk about the bombardment. You know, we want to understand the bombardment history of the moon. So here's a picture of the near side and the far side of the moon. And we're going to concentrate just on the oldest, biggest impact craters we have on there. We call these basins. These are uh, basins are craters that are larger than about 300 kilometers or so. And estimates suggest that maybe we have between about 45 to 90 of these big guys. Uh, that they formed somewhere between about 3.7 and 4.5 and billion years ago. They may range all the way to the formation of the moon and go from you know, about 600 to 700 million years after that point. 
Okay? So here's a topographic map so you can see some of these pop out a little bit better. The oldest basin we think exists on the moon that's still visible, that's not, let's say, subdued away or anything else, is South Pole Aiken Basin. And we have no age constraints on that when that formed. All we know is that it's older than about 3.9 billion years old. Okay? The basins where we do have accepted ages, okay? and even these are some controversy about that, but we have the Imbrium Basin, we have the Serenitatis Basin, and by superposition, we bracketed the age of the Oriental Basin, and all these basins are about 3.7 to 3.9 billion years old. Okay? So that's about, you know, again, about 600, 700 million years after we believe the moon formed. Okay? So you think about that. Well, you know, what's, what's the difference between a really old, an, an old age and a really old age? Well, there's about 600 million years of solar system history there. So the question is, why do you have such big impacts landing on the moon at such a late time? Okay? So that's part of it. But we can even go a little bit further here. Okay? So this is just a, a model, just a little cartoon uh, model I came up with, just showing what happens on a surface of lots of impactors are hitting it, and you get a size distribution. So you can see the size distribution growing over time. If you go to a given surface, let's say on the moon or somewhere else, and you grab a sample back, and you think it's representative of that surface, you can use the total number of critters there to give you an average impact flux. Now we don't know if the impact flux was high, and then there was nothing for a long time, and it was high again, but it tells you something about what the impacts, uh, what was going on from an impact perspective. On the other hand, if you know the impact flux really, really well, you can use it to date different surfaces. And that's how we get the ages for different places on Mars, different places on Mercury and the rest. And it's all benchmarked back to the moon. So if the moon is wrong, then we're wrong everywhere. And so that's a big concern. So we need to understand the moon really well. Okay. So when we take the best information we have today back from the Apollo program and to some degree the Russian Luna program, we have samples. This is time before present and billions of years. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to shift so I do both sides, but I'm going to forget. Okay, so this is time before presence in billions of years. This is cumulative number of craters larger than four kilometers per square kilometer. And you see all these dots over here. These are places where we have samples where we think we've characterized a given terrain and the number of craters on it. And the big thing, there's a, I could spend a long time discussing all the interesting things in this plot, but the thing I want to point out here is if you go further, far enough back in time, about 3.8 billion years ago, the impact flux all of a sudden goes up by about a factor of 100 what it is, over what it is today. Okay, so something very big was happening back at that time. And those numbers may even be larger because of crater saturation issues. Okay, so the question is, why do we have such a big impact flux that's happening over this time period? Okay, so one possibility is that we have something of an impact spike. Okay, so this was suggested by Terra et al. back in 1974, looking at the lunar samples. They suggested that maybe the moon formed, there was a long lull, and then all of a sudden big impacts spiked up and we made a bunch of big impacts about this time. This is often referred to in the literature as a terminal cataclysm. Okay? The other alternative that's happened is that maybe there was a declining bombardment. So this means that the moon formed and then the leftover planetesimals continued to hit the moon for a long period of time. And eventually they sort of ran out of gas, about 3.8, 3.9. So those basins you see are the end of the line. Okay? And these two groups have been fighting it out. Okay? Since 1970s, these camps have been going back and forth, and the data is just ambiguous enough that neither camp can really win. And so right now we have a deadlock. Okay? Neither side's really willing to give in. And so the question is, how do we get beyond this deadlock, and how do we come up with what's really going on? So in this talk, I'm going to try to bring in some new data sets beyond what we've uh, talked about before, and also some new numerical models, and hopefully put together a picture. And I think what I'm going to find, like a lot of things, you know, that, that there's some compromise. There's some room for both sides to win here, okay? which is probably not too surprising. So we're going to need to do, use both these models to get at probably the true answer. Okay. So the outline for my talk is going to be, I'm going to talk about the earliest time of bombardment on the moon. And that means talking about the end of planet formation, or what I'm going to call late accretion. And this is where I've actually worked with some cosmochemists who have taught me a number of new things and brought some new constraints to this problem, which are really nice. So we'll deal with the early bombardment of the moon. And then I'm going to talk about what's called the late heaven bombardment. I'm going to talk about a model which is actually uh, quite provocative, but it seems to work remarkably well, and it's called the Nice model. And then I'm going to talk about some problems we have in the Nice model and a possible new solution, which I'm going to call the E-belt. Now, I'm not going to tell you what all these little jargon terms are until I get to that point. So, okay. So let's start off with talking about late accretion on the Earth, Moon, and Mars. So to talk about late accretion, I have to talk about planet formation. If I'm talking about planet formation, I, you know, I could, again, I could spend like a week talking about all the things I know about planet formation. I still wouldn't even be close to saying everything that needs to be said. And also, half of what I would say would probably be wrong. Okay, so I'm just going to give you the bare bones in about a minute. This is how planet formation is believed to have worked in a standard model. Okay, so the idea is that we start off with a solar nebula, or we start off with a nebula, it collapses into a disk of material. Out of that disk, we have small grains growing ultimately into planetesimals, probably by turbulent, uh, uh, turbulent concentration mechanisms, and ultimately we end up with a system which may exist to have protoplanets and planetesimals all living together 
in the in, in close to the sun, we have rocky material. Further away, we have icy material. So there's a lot more. There's a lot more you could say here, but let me just focus on the inner solar system for the moment. And so let me just show you a little simulation. So let's imagine we've grown the planetesimals up to let's say moon to Mars size objects. What happens at that point? Okay. So if we go forward here, what takes place is that the embryo starts slamming into one another. This is just a very simple movie. This is distance in and semi direct. Semi, it's distance in AU. This is how much uh, mass you get. And if you watch all these embryos collide together, eventually you get to the point where you make something about the size of an Earth at about 1 AU, and you make this something about the size of Venus at about where it should, Venus should be. And somewhere along the line, you have some very big impacts, maybe Mars-sized objects slamming into the proto-Earth. Okay? So this is how we think we get something uh, like our Earth and Venus. Now, the real models that people are working on today are much more sophisticated. There's a lot more bells and whistles and other things, but it, the flavor is the same. This is roughly what's going on here. And so what people suggested long ago is that we can use this process to our advantage. Oops, go forward. That somewhere along the line, very late in the game, the Earth gets hit by probably something on the order of the size of Mars. And when it hits, it creates a protolunar disk, and out of that protolunar disk eventually grows our moon. Okay. Now the timing of this event is uncertain. The best timing we have today suggests maybe this happened about 60 million years after the first solids formed. But really this could be 30 million years. There's lots of debate on this topic. But that's not really the point. It happens somewhat late in the game in terms of planet formation. And when this impact takes place, we get a final phase of core formation on the Earth and on the Moon. So the Moon forms and makes a core, and it undergoes a global magma ocean. The Earth probably had a core before this point, but regardless, this impact produces a final core. Okay? And then at that point, you may have had a magma ocean on the Earth. There's some debate about that. But eventually, a stable lunar crust forms, the Earth also gets a crust, and eventually plate tectonics start. And in terms of impacts affecting things, most people think, well, that's it. We're done. Right? We don't need to worry about things anymore at least in terms of the internal structure of these worlds. But is that really true? And that's what I guess I thought until, uh, well, I went to grad school, I learned some things, and I forgot it. And then I started interacting with some cosmochemists, namely Rich Walker and James Day. And they've actually said some very interesting things to me. And this takes me to a part of the talk I'm gonna call the curious case of the highly siderophile elements, okay? So what's a highly siderophile element? Geez, I had to think about what this was. What they are, they're metals, okay? They are metals like iridium and platinum and gold and, and osmium and some other things here. And they have special properties. And that, namely what they have is they have, they have what, the, what the cosmochemists would say, they have high metal to silicate partition coefficients. And all this really means is if you have a melt and the iron goes, let's say, towards the center of your world, all these highly syrup elements really, really, really want to follow the iron. And so they go with it. And so if you had a standard model where you melted the earth, all of these elements should have gone to the core, and they should be only be present at about the 10 to the minus fifth level on the Earth, okay, and in, in the upper mantle. So we shouldn't have any gold, we shouldn't have any iridium, but yet we do. And so the question is, what's happened? Okay, so something is funny, because in this plot, this is actually the abundance of highly sterile elements we have on the Earth today. So here are some different elements. This is uh, estimates we have from Rich Walker and James Day. This is uh, the upper mantle abundance over uh, the carbonaceous chondrite abundance. So this is a primitive type of carbonaceous chondrate. And what you can see is not only are these lines fairly flat, so the abundance we have seems to be fairly chondritic, but it's actually only down by about a factor of 200. It's not at the 10 to the minus fifth level, which is very odd. Okay, this has been long been known, and people have been struggling to understand this. Okay, if we go to the moon, the moon is actually much lower than that of the Earth, but it's still down by about a factor of 20, but it's still higher than what our models would suggest by a fair amount. So the question is, what's going on? Okay, well, there's different proposals put forward to solve this, but I'm gonna focus on one set of solutions which seems to have the least problems with it. And that's something we're gonna to refer to as late accretion. Or if, for those that remember, they used to call this the late veneer problem, but I've been told by Rich Walker I shouldn't use late veneer because everyone thinks the late veneer means something else. So I'm gonna use late accretion. So here's the same model I showed before, but now there's a little bit more physics in it. And so now what you're looking at is protoplanets and planetesimals. So these are moon to Mars sized objects. The green guys are all planetesimals. And this is Jupiter out here. We're just going to let them evolve. Okay, so this is just to set the stage for something. So this is basically the same kind of model you saw before. The embryos start to slam into one another, and eventually you get a, a proto-Earth and a proto-Venus and the rest. And somewhere late in the game, you have a Mars-sized object hitting the Earth, and presumably that gets to the Moon. But you'll notice when most of these red guys go away, you still have a lot of these green planetesimals flying around. So they continue to bombard the Earth and Moon for an extended time after the Earth and Moon, or after the Earth has this formative core formation event. So if the Earth differentiates and all the iron and highly sphere elements go to the core, what you have is you have a way to restock it by having things hit afterwards. 
And so the number, amount, abundance of highly stirred up elements may tell us about how much stuff was added to the earth and added to the moon after they had their final core formation stage. So it tells us about the end of accretion. Okay. This was first suggested by, I should say, by Cho et al. in 78, and people have been following up on that since then. Okay. So how much mass do we need? Okay. So if you actually look at the earth, what the abundance that we have suggests that we need to add about a half a percent of Earth's mass to the Earth after it had its final core formation event, or after the moon forming event. Okay? Now the moon is much, has a much lower abundance, and it turns out the amount of mass we need to add to the moon is about a factor of, a, uh, about a factor of 1,200 less than that. And that could come in different forms. It could come in the form of a whole bunch of tiny objects hitting these worlds, or it could come in the form of a whole bunch of big bodies hitting the world, or something in between. And the question is, how do we decipher this? What do we work from that? Okay, so now here's the problem. And this is what, um, when I t started interacting with, uh, with Rich and James, they came to me with this problem and I was puzzled by this. Because something I know from orbital dynamics of dealing with near-Earth asteroids is that you're trying to figure out how much hits the moon and how much hits the Earth, you have to worry about the cross-sections of these worlds. So this is, you know, these objects to scale. And while the Earth is a big target and the moon is small, the ratio for the cross-sections, when you include gravity, is only about 20 to 1. So that means for every time a, an object hits the moon, about 20 end up hitting the Earth. But from a mass perspective, we need a ratio of about 1,200. Okay, so that's very that's a very big difference. It's two orders of magnitude. So how are we going to deal with that? So one possibility, well, not quite two orders of magnitude, but or same idea. So one possibility is that when things hit the moon, all the ejecta goes flying into space, and the moon never accretes anything. And that's been proposed as a way to get out of this. But there's been some numerical hydrocode simulations of this done recently, and they suggest that at best maybe you lose about 40% of the projectile mass. So you still have a lot of stuff or you still have a big difference and a lot of stuff hitting the moon that stays there. So you have this factor of 700. So what are we going to do? So finally, after thinking about this and talking to these guys, I thought, well, you know, it can't be hard to write a model. So I wrote a little toy model to test some ideas. So I'm going to show you some of the results from that. And it's, it's fairly simple, and almost anyone could do this, and the answers are actually kind of interesting. Okay, so this is, you know, so imagine you had a whole bunch of stuff flying around in space, and it has a size distribution. So you have some big guys and some small guys. We can actually characterize the size distribution according to diameter and the number of objects you have. So if I say you have, let's say, a steep population, that means most of the mass is in the small guys. So over here, I'm sorry, I'll try to do some over here too. So we have small guys, a bunch of small guys, and only a little bit of mass in the big guys. Okay? If I have a shallow population, so this is where the numbers get lower, you can see most of the mass is in the big guys, and only a really, relatively little mass is in the small guys. Okay? So let's test different size distributions hitting the Earth and Moon, and using what we know, and see what we get. Okay. So what you're looking at here is a whole bunch of little uh, Monte Carlo code runs, just to show you how stochastic events affect things. Okay, so this is, um, this is, these are size distributions that are hitting the Earth, and I've assumed that it's going to get hit by 2,000 impactors drawn from a size distribution that I've chosen. In this case, I've chosen a very steep distribution. Here's the moon, it's down by a factor, the impacts are down by a factor of 20, so here's 100 impacts. And then here's just 20 different trials. So every time you see the movie jump, that means I'm doing a different trial. And what you can see is if you have lots and lots and lots of impactors hitting both worlds, you really can't escape the 20 to 1. You're always bouncing around that. And this yellow line is where we want to get to. So that's no good. Okay. So we decided then try, okay, well, let's just try to limit the number of impactors. Let's go to, let's get 40 impactors for the Earth, and we get two for the Moon, and let's see if that affects things. And now what happens is every now and then the Earth gets hit by something very big that the Moon never sees, and now you can see the stochastic variation actually starts to work a little bit better. We're not quite at the yellow line, but it's the right direction, which is good. Okay. So now let's try a very shallow population. So if we have a very shallow population of impactors, so most of the masses in the big guys, now all of a sudden, 25 to 30 percent of the time, we're reaching our success rate. Okay. So this suggests that at, towards the end of accretion, after the moon forming event took place, we had some very big things in a shallow population flying around. Okay. And so if we run all the numbers, we do a little bit better job, we can see there's sort of a sweet spot that for fairly shallow distributions, about minus two differential, we actually get about 30 to 40 percent of the time, we're reproducing what we see in the Earth and Moon. Now this is a cute result, but that's really old as it's cute, because it's just one number, right? You can't make too big a deal out of this. But what we can do is to see other other things in the solar system that reflect this kind of pattern. Okay. So this is some work I did recently with Alessandro Morbidelli in 2009 in Icarus, where we looked at how some of the new ideas on how we make planetesimals would go into accretion, and how they would affect some of the worlds that would be produced. So what, you, what we did is we created a whole bunch of 100 kilometer objects. We think that's, for various reasons, we think that's maybe the base size of planetesimals. And we let them accrete within this code. And what happens is occasionally they bump into one another and get larger and then more bump in. And if they get large enough, they begin to undergo runaway growth and they can grab a lot of stuff. But what you notice is when they start to get large enough, they start to fall along this very shallow pattern. Okay? Basically, they're grabbing everything they can and they start to grow along this way. The slope of that 
It's just about what we're predicting in our model. It's about a minus two. Okay, so this suggests that when objects get very big, we, the, most of the mass goes into these guys, and, be, and the shallow population seems to be consistent with what we see. There's another thing that's nice here, too. So now I'm going to turn on collisional evolution. So we know all these planetesimals in the inner solar system are beating up on one another, and they're grinding away. And what happens is that when you have grinding, a lot of the little guys go away, because they're fairly easy to break up, but these big objects with a fair amount of gravity are very hard to disrupt. Okay? And so what happens is once you get this very shallow population, you tend to keep it. Okay, so as you can see, it doesn't change very much over here and over here. So that's good. So that also seems to make, it suggests it's a robust result. And now what we're going to do is we're going to add in a little bit more data we have. We actually have some evidence of what the planetesimals used to look like from the asteroid belt. So if we go to the inner asteroid belt from about, let's say, you know, where it st starts about 2 AU, and we go out to about 2.8 AU or so, and we put all the asteroids in there, that's that purple line you're going to see there. And it turns out, most of this data, we can't really say very much, but at the big end, we have things like Ceres and Pallas and Vesta. And if you plot them up, you get a size distribution which matches pretty much what we're suggesting from our accretion codes. And the red line is what we actually get from the largest Martian basins. There's a lot of uncertainty about how to transform these back into projectiles, but it could be that they do something very similar as well. So what does all this mean? This means we can say something about the biggest projectiles that were hitting the Earth and Moon and Mars after they had their major core forming events, assuming this model is correct and then we can put everything together. So if this is right, we suggest that after the moon forming event took place, the Earth probably got hit by something maybe on the order of 2,500 to 3,000 kilometers. The biggest projectile that hit the moon was probably on the order of 250 to 300 kilometers. And for Mars, we probably have about 1,500 to 1,800 kilometers. So when these numbers popped out, my first thought was something like this. Like, oh my god, it can't be right. It's, it's got to be something wrong with this model. Okay, But you start to look at the physics and it gets kind of interesting. Okay. First of all, we, we know the Earth survived a, 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 an impact from a Mars-sized object. So having a smaller object isn't so bad. The real question is, can you keep all of the highly sterophile elements and iron from that projectile out of the core of the Earth? So can we do that? The answer is, I don't know. This is right at the, right at the edge of what we can do from a modeling perspective. The real experts on this, Dave Stevenson and others, are working the problem, but putting all the physics in is very interesting. It's very difficult. But something that this is probably a flavor of what happens here. So when something that big hits the moon, you get the physics of what they call a hit and almost run collision. This is work that's done by Eric Asfog and the rest. So you have a projectile come in, it hits, and most of the core from that projectile ends up going in into this almost long spiral arm-like structure. And then it begins to gradually reaccrete in the form of small fragments back on the earth, almost uniformly over the world. So you've taken the core, you've broken it down into small bits, and then you put it into a position where it can be emulsified in the upper mantle. So this may be a way to keep all that stuff out of the core and explain why we have such uniform abundances across the Earth. So we'll have to see if this is right. This is something of a, um, of a, uh, pr a prediction. But, and we can't prove it yet, but it's interesting. Okay. Also, the other thing we could test is angular momentum. If you have something that big hit the Earth, you actually change the obliquity of the Earth. And it turns out when you run the numbers, on average you change it by about 10 degrees. And that's okay, because our Earth's obliquity day is about 23 degrees, so we're well within constraints. But it also suggests if you had this impact happen very, very early on, you can jolt the Earth enough to possibly give you the inclination of the moon. Okay? The numbers actually work out pretty well. Now, we already have other models to explain the inclination of the moon. Um, this is sort of a plan B option, but it could be interesting. It could work. So I'll keep going on. So here's the moon. So the moon, we already have one fairly large basin, the South Pole Aiken Basin, that may have come from such a large impact. But it's hard to say. It depends on the impact velocities and the rest. There's also been a suggestion that the reason the near side of the moon is so different from the far side is that possibly this represents an ancient subdued basin. That was, so maybe the moon was hit very early on by something very large. It's hard to say much more about this. The data just isn't there to support this, or, or is the modeling, but it's possible. Okay? And then there's also one other thing that's interesting from this. There's been a lot of talk about water in the interior of the moon, that in the upper mantle of the moon you may have had a fair amount of water, maybe more than we thought. And people are wondering, can you actually get the water into protolunar disk from the Earth to the moon? Well, a pl another plan B is that if you assume the moon was hit by this larger projectile, okay, and you assume that it only had maybe a tenth of a percent of water, so that's about the same amount of water you have in, as an ordinary chondrite or instite chondrite, and you mix it into the mantle, it turns out you get about one to three parts per million weight percent water. And that's about the same values that people are finding in the estimates. So it could be that water was also an addition to the moon after the moon reached its full size. Finally, we have Mars, and I'm only going to briefly talk about Mars, but um, when you run the numbers on how many highly sterophile, the abundance of highly sterophile elements we need, it turns out we predict that the projectile hits that should be about 1,500 to 1,800 kilometers. That's just about the size you need to make the Borealis Basin, 
The Borealis Basin is this enormous basin on Mars that some people believe explains why the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere of Mars are so different. They need very large projectiles according to hydro, the, uh, the, the hydrocode simulations, and that's what we seem to be getting. So it's interesting. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say all the stuff I've just said is definitive, but it's something to think about. Okay, so if we can have late accretion make all these impacts on the moon, can we actually make some of all the basins on the moon? Some of these basins I talked about later earlier in the talk. Well, it turns out we ran that problem, and it seems like it doesn't, it's not clear if it can actually do that. So what we did is we took a model. We had all this stuff flying, all these leftover planetesimals flying around. We wanted to see, can we have stuff that lives long enough to hit the moon and make basins where we have good ages, like Imbrium and Oriental. So we put in dynamical evolution, and we also put in a collision code, because all these things undergo collisional grinding. We have to worry about that. Okay? So the goal was to see if we could make these objects. And what we found, though, is that the population of planetesimals in the inner solar system basically self-destructs. They beat up on one another, and in the end, while we want to make at least two basins here, Imbrium and Oriental, our results suggest we only make about 0.02 basins. Okay, so we're down actually by about, where we can actually rule this out at about the three sigma level. So what that means is we need something else to explain all the basins we have on the moon. The early basins can come from late accretion, but we can't make these late basins. And so we need something else. Okay, so that suggests maybe a cataclysm is something we need to think about. Okay, so this takes us to part two of my talk, which is to talk about the so-called late heavy bombardment. So I gave you a little bit uh, of a preview of this early in, when I started the introduction. Um, it turns out the late heavy bombardment is this really interesting and controversial topic. And everyone thinks they understand things about the late heavy bombardment. And I was trying to explain how much my, in, earlier today in this talk I was giving, I was trying to explain how much my thoughts have evolved on the late heavy bombardment since I started this project. And I came across this really great quote from Artemis Ward. He's actually an American humor writer. And he was actually one of the favorites of Abraham Lincoln. And he's got some great quotes, but one in particular I liked was that it ain't, so much thing, it ain't so much the things that we don't know that get us into trouble, it's the things that we do know that just ain't so. Okay? And this pretty much sums up how much I've been fighting against some of the things that I've been doing, because I think the constraints are telling me this, I'm sure they are, and it turns out when I look at it in detail, they're not, and it's actually, it's actually keeping me from doing good work. So here are some common knowns about the late heaven bombardment that people think that may not be so. Okay? First of all, that all these basins on the moon formed in a spike. And that spike started about 3.9 billion years ago, and it lasted about 200 million years or so. Okay? Second, that all the lunar basins we see are in that spike. Or, if you believe the declining bombardment model, none of the basins are in the spike. Okay? Third, that the late heavy bombardment ended everywhere across the solar system. On every world, it ended about the time the last basin oriental formed, about 3.7 billion years ago. That's what people think. Okay? And then finally, that all large-scale late heaven bombardment impact signatures have been erased from the Earth. There's literally nothing left. I want to make the case over the next uh, 20 minutes or half hour or so that all of these are wrong at some level. Okay, at least I think they're wrong. So let's go and talk about the constraints a little bit. This is an important part of the talk. So when the Apollo astronauts brought back samples, they actually brought back samples from close to Imbrium, from close to several other basins. And you see these red guys here. These are impact melts. And these impact belts all seem to have ages around 3.8 to 4 billion years ago or so. And so people thought, well, we're really seeing something very, very important and very uh, big that's happening on the moon at that time. But if we've analyzed more of the data and we've looked at different chronometers, we actually start to see a lot of ages which go maybe out to about 4.1 billion years or so. Okay? So you have to worry about this. So what are we actually measuring when we talk about the big bombardment on the moon? Okay? There's another issue as well. Okay? And that is, this is where all the lunar samples have found, were found on the moon. This is where uh, the red shows where the Russian Luna probes landed and got samples back. And all of these samples are very close to the Imbrium Basin. Okay? And some people have argued because Imbrium Basin is so big and it's so late in the game that all of these sites have been contaminated at some level by Imbrium ejecta. Okay? So we have to worry about the signature we're getting out of the moon. If you see a spike, are we really seeing a true spike or are we just seeing Imbrium again and again? That's something that people debate about. Okay? So to get around this, I'm going to try to show a couple other data sets which may be reflective of some other, of other things happening at interesting times. So this is the famous uh, Allen Hills 84001 uh, meteorite that you know, everyone knows and loves. And it, what's interesting about it is, well, there's lots of interesting things about it, but the interesting part for me in this talk is that it actually has a new crystallization age of about 4.1 billion years. It's actually, go, it's no longer four and a half billion years as people suggested in the past. And that's for various uh, cosmochemical regions, reasons. It also has some carbonate phases that are, last between about 3.9 and 
So these ages are kind of interesting compared to what we were thinking about in terms of the moon. They're kind of late in the game for some of the things we're thinking about, but okay. We also have Martian meteorites called Shurgatites. The Shurgatites are fairly young. They're all fairly maybe 200 million years old to 600 million years old or so. But they have a very strange group of lead lead ages that go all the way back to 4.1 billion years. Now, and there's been a lot of controversy on this age. I've talked to a lot of people. Most people say the age is real. But ultimately what they say is that somehow the source region for the Shurgatites has been disturbed at about the same time, you know, about 4.1. That's about the same time here. So it's hard to say very much about this. There's not much data, but something interesting is happening around 4.1 uh, billion years ago on Mars. Okay. Now we also have asteroids. Okay. Now Vesta, we've just Dawn mission has just reached Vesta. So I should have put in a new picture, but then you just look at the picture and you wouldn't pay attention to me. So that's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna avoid that. But we actually probably have samples from Vesta. These are called the Howardites, the Eucrites, and the Diogenite meteorites. They've landed on the Earth. Spectroscopically, they're a great match for what we have on Vesta. And what we find is that there are a number of what we call shock degassing ages. These are events where the, these uh, samples were heated up in the past, probably cratering events on Vesta. And then eventually, through different processes, they made their way to Earth. And we see a lot of events between about 4.1 and about 3.3 billion years ago. And before that, there's something of a lull. Okay? And if we compare that to the moon, it actually is a, a kind of an interesting match, at least where things start to get going, although the tail is a little bit different here. Okay? We see a very similar pattern if you look at another different meteorite group called H chondrites. These are ordinary chondrites. These are some of the, most, uh, some of the biggest class of meteorites that fall on the Earth. What you see here is that we have 4.5 billion years ago. There's something going on. There's kind of a lull. And then again, about 4.1, things kind of spike up again. And this is work done by uh, Tim Swindle and uh, Dave Kring. And I should mention Don Bogart did a lot of the other work in the previous ones. There's also uh, some other meteorite classes, but data is very limited, but they tend to show the same flavor of signature. Okay? So if one, we're going to look at all this data and just try to carefully account for what we see in the moon, a very broad characterization would say that something seems to be going on about 4.1 billion years ago. Okay? There's some, that's, if one had to say the late bombardment started somewhere, it might be there. Okay? That most of the events uh, on the moon that we, or the major events lasted till about 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago on the moon, but they probably extended to about 3.3 in the asteroid belt or so. And then finally, most of the evidence we have for a really narrow spike, okay, tends to come from samples from the moon that were drawn near Imbrium, okay. Other than that, there's just not a lot of information or for or a lot of data for a really narrow spike of impacts, okay. So we have to keep all this in mind, okay. So this tells you, so that's the constraints we have in the bombardment history. So now let's go to some of the dynamics. So the question is, for a long time, was how could you get a, a cataclysm? How can you get all these big impactors flying around so late in the game? So to talk about that, I have to say something about what was going on in the outer solar system. And this takes me to something that's been, uh, been, that's been called uh, the Nice model. Okay, so what is the Nice model? Well, the Nice model was developed in Nice, France, by uh, four scientists. It was developed by uh, Alessandro Morbidelli, Hal Levison, Clementa Saganis, and Rodney Gomez. And you can see that they, uh, this is actually a picture from the observatory up in Nice, France. They work at the Blue Coast Observatory there. And they, they were all there together for about a year. And you can see they really had to suffer along the French Riviera. You know, it's, you know, they had to deal with this great food and great wine and all these great things. And somehow they managed to get science done so we can all feel sorry for their, their how much they've sacrificed for their art. Okay. But ultimately what they were trying to deal with was the following problem. They were trying to explain issues about the Kuiper Belt. But ultimately, this, the fundamental problems with this is that for a long time, we've been arguing about, they're trying to understand planet formation. And the idea was the giant planets had to form where we see them today. And then out here, we have this comet population, or I should say maybe Kuiper Belt objects, and they had to form where they are today. And it turns out trying to make that model work is almost impossible. We have not found a scenario that makes it work. We cannot make Uranus and Neptune over the age of the solar system today. Okay? The objects that are very big in the Kuiper Belt, like Pluto and the rest, we cannot make them because there's only about a tenth of an Earth mass out there today. Jupiter and Saturn are on slightly eccentric and slightly inclined orbits. That's not what is predicted from, gas, from, form, from formation models where they grab a lot of gas from the disk. And I can go on and on. We can't make this model work. And finally, what these guys decide is there's some assumption we're making that has to be wrong. And so one thing they tried in sort of a fit of desperation, I think it's probably over too much wine or something, but they suggested that maybe the giant planets form in a more tight configuration. So in this case, Jupiter is just about the same place, but here Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune form between, let's say, let's say about 5 AU and maybe about 12 AU to 15 AU or so. And beyond that, you don't have this really puny disk of comets, but you have a massive disk of comets, which is maybe on the order of several tens of Earth masses or so. So they said, well, let's model this and see what happens. Okay, so let me just go forward here. <clears throat> 
And I should mention too that they shouldn't be given sole credit. A lot of researchers like Renul Malhotra and others have suggested pieces of this, but they were the first ones to sort of put it all together. So what you're looking at here is a top view of the solar system. Here are the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and they're all in circular orbits in this tight configuration. And beyond that, they have this big disk of comets. And on the, on the right side, you see semi-major axis versus eccentricity. Okay, semi-major axis versus eccentricity. So this system's very happy, but you notice that the disk is losing mass. It's interacting with this outermost planet. And when this material comes down, it's causing the objects to slowly migrate. And so they're migrating out over time. And you'll notice there's a little dashed line here on the right. That's a special place I'll talk about in a second. When Saturn gets to that place, things get very interesting. Okay, so I'll stop talking for a second and take a look what happens here. Okay. And you'll see the other one go in just a second here. Okay. That's always fun, right? So that is a possible source for the bombardment history of the moon, or for the late bombardment of the moon. So what did you see? Okay, so there's a lot, I'm gonna give you just the, the basic Nice model. There's all sorts of flavors and variants and some of this stuff is coming off the computers right now. But essentially what you saw there is that Saturn was migrating and eventually it migrated into what's called a resonance with Jupiter. And what this is, is that imagine this uh, planet on the inside is going around twice. For every time this planet on the outside is going around once. This means because of this orbital configuration, they always meet where the hash marks are. So they meet again and again and they have the same geometry with respect to one another at those hash marks. So that means the little gravitational kicks they exert on one another can build up and ultimately be, be allowed to change the orbits of these planets in even just a slight way. Okay? So this is a quicker version of the same movie. So what happens here is these, these planets are migrating, migrating, and when Jupiter and Saturn enter into the resonance, they actually change their orbits ever so slightly. They get slightly more inclined, they get slightly more eccentric, and that destabilizes the system. And Uranus and Neptune are actually sent into the disk and they migrate through it. Okay? And they send everything all over, in what's called a kablooey, right? So this is, this is a technical term. Okay, it's a technical term. We had, we we had to come up with that. So, so but there are reasons why. That this, now this, sounds, this just seems like complete craziness. I understand, but there's actually reasons we like this, and we've actually been beating on this model for about five or six years, trying to find flaws in it. And it, but so far, it's actually held up against every test, and it's actually taught us a lot about the solar system, which is really neat. So, for example, one of the reasons we like this is that the blue dots are the orbits of the giant planets today. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. This is semi-major axis, this is eccentricity and inclination. Semi-major axis, eccentricity and inclination. And you can see that the red lines are, are different simulations from uh, where they just tweak the initial conditions. This does a remarkable job of reproducing the orbits of the giant planets. There is no model that we have today that can do anything close to this. So this is what we have. Okay? There's no other model that's competition right now. Maybe something will come up, but this model can do a lot. Okay? And the main variable, other than the initial conditions of the planets, is just how much of a disk you have. Okay? The other things you get is you also get to explain from this model. We've been able uh, this model has been able to explain why we have Trojan asteroids, what their size distribution is, why we have Hilda asteroids, and give you the orbital distribution and size distribution of the Kuiper belt objects, and give you the orbit and size distributions of the irregular satellites around the giant planets. It can do many more things in terms of the in terms of the regular satellites. I can go on and on and on. It's a very exciting model. Okay, so um, in fact, look, there's about ten talks in there I just gave, or I could give on this all on these issues. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on what these, all these things on the NIST model does for the inner solar system, for the asteroid belt. So now we're going to come back to the inner solar system again. So here's what happens. So you have an asteroid belt that's sitting there, and all of a sudden the giant planets start moving around and doing crazy things. Well, if they're moving around doing crazy things, all their resonances that are associated with them are also doing crazy things. And some of them sweep across the asteroid belt. So imagine this is a little cartoon model of the asteroid belt, and you have a resonance sweep across, some things are simply just pushed out of the asteroid belt and they reach the inner solar system. Okay, so this is another, again another source for impactors on the moon at interesting times. So if you have this, essentially what you have is after some delay, okay, so in the delay is sort of arbitrary depending on initial conditions, all of a sudden according to the classical Nice model, you get a very big spike of comets which lasts a few tens of millions of years, and then you get this uh, bunch of asteroids heading over about 200 million years, and you can make lots of basins, and everyone's happy, right? This is a way to explain the late heaven bombardment. But it turns out it has some issues. And one of the main issues is, is that according to the classical Nice model, the asteroid belt had to be pretty large at the time the uh, Nice model takes place. That would be about 20 times its current size. Okay, and that, it turns out to be a pretty interesting number. When the paper first came out, and these are all close friends of mine, right? So what I tell people is that because they're all close friends of mine, if I could prove them wrong, I'd do it in a second because it'd be fun. Right, so, okay. 
But um, I didn't notice this when it first came out, but it's become a bigger issue as time has gone on. It's very hard to have the asteroid belt be so large for such a long period of time and not to have a lot of consequences for things we see in the asteroid belt. But there are other problems, and maybe a more fundamental one is this. Okay, so this is the asteroid belt as we know and love today. This is the major axis, this is the inclination, and these red dots represent the biggest asteroids we have. So most, it's basically objects less than absolute magnitude 9.7, so it's about 50 kilometer guys. Okay, and you'll notice right here there's very few at high inclinations. Okay, they're almost all at low inclinations. Well, if the Nice model does what we think it does, and resonances sweep across very slowly across the asteroid belt, you'll notice that you get a picture that looks like this that doesn't look like the asteroid belt. Okay, we have all these things at high inclinations, that's very bad. We make big holes in the asteroid belt, that's also bad. Okay, so this can't be the right solution. Okay, so what people have come across, and this is work that's been done by David Mitten and Renu Malhotra and Alessandro Morbidelli and Ramon Brasser and there's several others I could mention, is that they found out there are ways to actually make the resonance to sweep very fast across the asteroid belt, so you actually do a pretty good job of reproducing what we see today. You don't get lots of high inclination guys, you don't make big holes. But the cost of that is that you don't remove very much from the asteroid belt. You maybe only remove about a factor of two or a factor of three from the main belt. Okay? And that means we don't have a lot of mass anymore to mound make the late heaven bombardment. So now all of a sudden we're down so low that we're only making a very small number of basins. And for various reasons, I, even this, as fast as I talk, I can't talk about this, I don't have root time. Comets can't make up the difference. So all of a sudden we've gone from having this great solution for making all the things we see in the moon all the late basins on the moon to now not having a solution at all. Okay, now we're stuck again. So we need somehow we need to get more impacts over a longer interval. Okay, so this is where I, I at least this is uh, uh, where I come into the Nice model story. Now I'm going to now talk about something I'm going to call the E belt. Okay, which I think is is also going to be uh, relevant to some of the things that Don Lowe was talking about a few months ago. And I think it's a, something of a missing link of what we have in this late heaven bombardment story. Okay, so. Some information that we haven't brought into this story so far is what the nature of the projectiles was that was hitting the moon. So this is a, a cosmochem plot, and I'm not a cosmochemist, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'll say something dumb. But here is gold and iridium and germanium. This is a, basically gives you a sense, these little envelopes, of what some of the projectile material was like that was striking the moon. And the, all these dots you see are different meteorite types. And what you can draw from this, if you look at where the dots are, like where they're touching the envelopes or where they're in the envelopes, is that many of the things that were hitting the moon had very unusual compositions. They weren't your standard asteroids or your standard things that look like comets. They were more like things like very dry uh, metamorphosed objects, like ens chondrites. In some cases, some people say there were even iron meteorites hitting the moon. Okay? So these are very different from what you expect. And if you look at the asteroid belt, these are very uncommon kinds of things. They do exist there, but they're not there in great abundance. Okay? So if you go from the outer solar system, we have lots of comet kind of guys. And if we move in, we get more processed metamorphosed size guys, but we still seem to be missing a component. If you're taking a random sample from the asteroid belt, this is not what you're going to get for impactors. But there is something we can say, that as you go closer to the terrestrial planet region, you tend to get more heated, more processed. So it seems like if somehow we could have something over here, we might be able to explain some of the things that would produce what we need for the late heaven bombardment. And interestingly enough, there is a tiny little population here which we call the Hungarias, and I'll talk more about that in a second, which may actually have the right kinds of flavors of compositions that could explain this. So here's a picture of the inner solar system. Here's Tresor Major Axis, here's eccentricity, here's inclination, and here are all the asteroids we have from about 1.4 to 2.5 beyond some size. Okay. This is where this resonance called the New Six marks the boundary of the asteroid belt today. And the other boundary we have is the Mars crossing boundary. Things that get onto an orbit where they can cross Mars eventually get eject, eventually get pulled out and it may have a chance of hitting the planets or what have you. Okay? And then we have this little population up here called the Hungarias, which again are this tiny population. The largest object there is maybe only about 10 kilometers or so, but they have very unusual compositions. And they're suggestive of the kinds of things that might have been reflected in the late heaven bombardment impactors. Okay. So what we can say then, is what I'm going to hypothesize is this is that the asteroid belt today ends at about 2.1 AU. But before the Nice model took place, there was no new six resonance. It was in a completely different position. It's very possible the asteroid belt had an extension. Okay, so the asteroid belt may have just kept going because there was no natural boundary there. It would just kept going down to a Mars crossing orbit. Okay, so I'm calling that the E belt because it's an extension to the asteroid belt. It's also an ex now largely extinct population. It may have been filled with lots of E-type asteroids. I can go on and on with E's, but okay, that's you don't want to get too carried away here. So this is how we tested this model. Okay, so we put a bunch of objects in here, 
and some major axis, or in this some major axis and this trusting inclination again. We put a bunch of objects in here. The colors are just sort of, you can just sort of distinguish from the inner and the outer. We gave them the same excitation of the asteroid belt, and we wanted to see what they would do. So we put them into a model where the giant plants are on their, on their orbits before the NIST model, and on their orbits after the NIST model, and we wanted to see what happens to them. So here's a little animation of that. So the first part of this, we wanted to see if they're stable. And so you can see you do lose some objects, but on the whole, you're only losing maybe about 15% of the population or so. And then when the NIST model takes place and the resonances move in position, you lose all of it. But you lose it over a fairly long time scale, which is interesting. Okay. So this model will keep playing, but there's a couple of things we like about this. First of all, this population has the orbits such that the objects are about 10 times more likely to hit the moon and the Earth than your standard asteroid. Okay, that's just the way it works. So you, get, you don't need a lot of mass to get a lot of bang for the buck, which is good. Second of all, the impact velocities actually go up by about a factor of two when the NIST nice model starts. And this actually may be reflected in the crater record. And I was going to talk about this, but there's no time. So I'll, it, uh, but we're, we have a paper submitted on this, which we're pretty excited about. And also you can do a lot of things with the impact profiles. I'm going to talk about that at the very end here. So let me just show a few things to suggest this isn't just crazy talk. Okay, so this is where we have, uh, after we've integrated our objects four billion years, and we've cloned them, we've done all sorts of things, and you compare it to where the observed Hungaria population is, and it actually seems to work pretty well. So this could be this extension of the asteroid belt actually tends to make this Hungaria population. But keep in mind, there aren't many Hungarias today. So when we look at our population, we actually find that our test bodies decay by about three orders of magnitude. But we can use then the known Hungarias to actually extrapolate back to see what the original population was. And when we do that, the population we get for this new component is about the same as what we think the asteroid belt was at the same time. The numbers really seem to work out pretty well. So this is a nice consistency check. It also suggests that this population makes about, on the order of about 10 lunar basins, okay? With a couple of them being very large, Imbrium to Oriental size. So this is good too. We're not trying to make every last basin on the moon, we're just trying to make some of them, okay? So if you put this together with the asteroid belt, and the component we're getting from sort of the classical asteroid belt, all told, we would say that the bombardment from asteroids starts at about the basin uh, called Nectaris. So it's about the last 12 basins or so. So this suggests that the cataclysm, or what you want to call it, starts about that time. Okay? And then, so we don't need, we're not trying to do everything. We're just trying to do some of it. Okay? Well, does this make sense? Well, there's a different, number of different ways I could show this, and I only have so much time. But one thing I wanted to show, though, is that we actually looked at our model and what it would predict for craters on this basin called Nectaris. And when we look at how many craters you would get from the asteroid belt and from our hypothetical E-belt, and you put them together, we actually get a remarkably good match to the craters we actually see on Nectaris today. So again, I wouldn't say that that's solid proof, but it's a nice consistency check. It's good that it works. Okay? We can also do this. Okay? So if we actually go and we look at the last lunar basin, which is Oriental, that forms about 3.7, 3.8 billion years ago and we assume there's 10 lunar basins formed from E-belt, we can actually scale everything. So this is the impact profile of what you get on the moon and what you get on the Earth. And what we find here is that if Oriental forms then, then our prediction would be that the late of Mabarban starts about 4.1 billion years ago. And that seems to be just about where we're seeing it across the solar system from different constraints. So if this is right, the Mabarban history of the moon, or the, 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 the last part of it, the cataclysm, is not, well, the cataclysm only in the sense that something dramatic happens, but it lasts about 400 million years on the moon in terms of making basins, which is nice. But there's more. Okay, so the other thing we can do is that we don't have to do just the basins. We can actually look at some of the largest craters we have in the moon. I'm going to call these KT-sized craters. These are craters that are maybe 160, 170, 180 kilometers or larger. And we can look at how many of those formed on the moon and what our model predicts. So we don't have great ages on these, base, on these craters, but we can bracket them by their terrains. And what we find in this time from between about 3.2 and 3.7, there's actually three lunar craters that fit that bill, and our model predicts three. So we get a really nice match in here. After that time, it turns out there's one observed crater, and our model predicts one. So again, that's a very nice match. Okay? But here's the interesting thing. Okay? So we do this nice match to the moon, and everything seems to work very well, but look at all the impactors on the Earth over this long period of time. Okay? So this takes us back to where Don Lowell was talking about just a few months ago. Okay? If you have something KT-sized or larger, and so it's a very large projectile and it slams into the Earth, it vaporizes silicates, it shoots them above the atmosphere, they cool while they're above the atmosphere, and then they rain back, and they produce what's called impact spherules. These are little sand-sized things. I even have some samples of this up here if you want to see. that are from a Bee Gorge in Australia that's about two and a half billion years old. Okay? So these droplets come back and they form, they form layers that are millimeters to in some cases centimeters thick. Okay? So, what happens is we have very little Archean terrain left. 
But so almost all the craters from these impacts are probably gone away. It'd be amazing if we found some, but we still have the impact spiral beds. So we can use this to constrain our models. So what I've done is taken our predictions for how many KT events happen, and I've looked at what Don Lowe has suggested, and uh, I should mention Barley as well. I'm working closely with Bruce Simonson, who was actually worried about some of the uh, our, some of the younger Archean terrains over here. And what we find is really interesting. Over this time period where, where, uh, where Lowe has, has done estimates, we see that there's nine, um, there, he predicts, I'm sorry, our model predicts nine model KT events. Observation, we have seven, but Don uh, sent in an email that he actually is seeing about nine or 10. And that number may even go up a little bit. So that's a very nice match there. Over here, we're actually getting about, we're predicting about three model KT events. Observationally, we have four. So that's really, statistically, that's the same. Over here, we have one spheral bed, but we have two craters. We have Freydefort and Sudbury, which are both KT sized. Our model predicts two and so forth. So you can see we're nicely filling out that entire profile. Okay, so it seems to work really well. So if this is right, the late heavy bombardment does not end at 3.8 billion years ago on the Earth. Okay, it actually continues on throughout the Archean. And what this means is that we get about 15 basins forming during the Archean, and many of these probably are the same size as Imbrium and Oriental. Okay, so we're getting 1,000 kilometer basins forming on the Earth during the Archean, and the whole thing probably from a basin perspective ends about two and a half billion years ago. In terms of KT events, we get those, they have a longer profile. They go, we get about 60 of those from about 3.7 to about 1.7 billion years ago. And so these are very, so I would predict that Freyda Fort and Sudbury may be the very tail of the late heaven bombardment on the Earth. Okay. And so finally, just to be, if I haven't been provocative enough, I want to say just a few other interesting provocative things and I'm going to stop. Okay. Uh, so there's a number of coincidences pop up if this model is right. If the big basins end about two and a half billion years ago, Something to point out is that the Great Oxidation Event happens about two and a half billion years ago. For some reason, the Great Oxidation Event waited. So the Earth gets a lot of oxygen at that point. For some reason, it waited for the basins to finish, to start. Maybe that's a coincidence, maybe not. Major continent building seems to happen on the Earth about 2.7, 2.5 billion years ago. Again, it seems to occur about the time the big basins stop. The oceans that we have go into a state where they're dominated by H2S. And that lasts for an extended period of time. That starts about 1.8 billion years ago. That starts just about the time the KT, the KT impact stop. And there may, that may actually represent a time when there was something of an impact lull. There may not be, have been many impacts while the oceans were in this stable and unusual state. I can't say any, there's connections for any of these things. It could be purely coincidences, but it's very interesting how this works out. So I think this is something to consider when we're thinking about the implications for astrobiology. What does it really mean to have such a late, late heavy bombardment on the Earth, and what does it do in terms of our thinking about life? So the reason we want to go back to the moon, okay, is that we get right lunar samples from the right places, it may actually tell us about the very last stages of planet formation throughout the solar system. And I'll stop there. Thank you. That was great, Bill. Um, Thank you. I'm going to start the first question. Okay. So could we, uh, do we have any Hungaria asteroids that we know as near Earth objects now? Do we have any Hungarias that are actually in the near-Earth object population yes. now? Probably. Um, Probably, but we're not sure. Well, the problem is, is that the, the inner solar system is very chaotic. So you can't, it's hard to, to make a definitive argument that this asteroid came from this source. But you can make probability arguments. And so almost certainly there are some. And if you point to some, you can make a case, but you can't prove it must be from there. So, so with the spectral signature you were saying is very distinctive. Yes. Something we could look for? The Hungarias are dominated by what's called E-type asteroids. And E-type asteroids are sort of an n site achondrite type of thing. And we do have some E-type NEOs. So it's reasonable to think that there's a connection there. There's a few E-types in the asteroid belt. For example, uh, the Steins asteroid that was imaged by Rosetta is an E, and that's in the main belt. But there's just not a lot of them. So it makes more sense that many of these come from the Hungarias than from the asteroid belt. I'd like to follow up on the final astrobiology comment. Yes. Um, we know at some level these, these basin, uh, basins on the Earth could include evaporating much of the ocean or even potentially sterilizing it. So does this extension of more big impacts in time affect our picture of the stability of the Earth as a, as a place where life could be evolving? What would, okay, I'm, I've, I've been reading astrobiology papers like mad for the last six months because I think there's things going on and I simply don't know the literature. My feeling from what I've read, and I'm going to be very naive, I, I can't say anything articulate because I don't understand the literature well enough, but it seems to me like life didn't, it, it was deterred by impacts, but it wasn't stopped. 
And a lot of the architecture for life was there for a long period of time, even though these impacts were taking place. But I think that we have to stop making absolute comments saying that, okay, I found this sample at 2.7 and this means that this extended period of time was like such, such things. With these big impacts hitting, it could be you could have moments where the earth was very different and then it goes back into a different state. And so you could have, you know, little, you could have very, you could have stochastic changes taking place. And I think that's something we have to consider. So to answer your question, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's very puzzling. You know, what, what is it, what is it, what does an embryo sized impact do to the earth? Let's say if it happens at 3.2 billion years ago, you know, it's, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, so um, I guess the, the issue with these kinds of uh, approaches, you're trying to satisfy many constraints at once, which you, uh, this one? Which you sort of have to do, uh, but uh, the danger is that you're explaining many things and when you check into them, you actually find out that some of the things you're trying to explain with a model are, are not, uh, the model does not really address them. Now with the Denise model, you had some things that the Denise model was explaining that it really doesn't address. Now, in, you, in the case of your model, uh, I'm trying to fit it with the Denise model, how that fits. You're, you're advocating for stochastic late accretion, bigger sizes. Well, it, it, exceeding the Earth. well it, it's two different parts. The late accretion part has nothing to do with the Denise model. That's just saying what's happening after the end of planet formation. And then the Denise model is what would give you the driver for the cataclysm. What I'm suggesting now is a new source for many of the impactors, which essentially is just a natural add-on to the Nice model. So we don't need to change the Nice model, we just need to think about where some of the projectiles could be coming from. But you, you are undercutting one of the main uh, pieces of evidence in favor of the Nice model. Uh, you're trying to undercut that piece of evidence for the Nice model in terms of the late heavy bombardment reflect, being reflected on the surface. Of the well, it, it, maybe I, would, I, would, I wouldn't say an undercut it. I would say it's a more sophisticated view. Um, because certain things that they've talked about early on were based on certain ideas, but our constraints have our constraints are now in a different place, and so we have to fit those constraints. And so that's the, that's what we need to worry about. Okay, just to close up here. So when you're saying that you're predicting that there are nine impacts uh, at such and such a time on the Earth, what is what exactly is the model that's going into that? So you have the smaller impactors are being uh, destroyed by collisional grinding. So you have bigger things. Uh, that survive. Yes. So at what point in those <coughs> nine impacts, what is sort of like the, the object sizes that are doing those? I mean, are you fitting? Well, how, how is that working? I, I well, 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 to get it, all right, I, I did want to talk about, you know, there, there's the whole issue of size distributions and the rest, but the thing to think about, I mean, that's just an impact profile. So if you, once you have an impact profile, you can multiply it by your size distribution and get however many impacts you want over a given time. What I'm saying is that KT impacts are probably coming from objects that are maybe on the order of eight kilometers, nine kilometers or so. And so there's just many of those flying around in the inner solar system. Or what's happening is they're flying, they're, they're leaving the Hungarias fairly late in the game and getting out and hitting things. And so this produces this long drawn out tail to the late heaven bombardment. And so that means the end of the late heaven bombardment is gonna be different on every single world. It's gonna be, you know, the end of it on Mercury is gonna be different than the end on Mars. And it's gonna be different than the end on Earth because you have to worry about what the tail is doing and then what the collision probability is between that tail and the given world. So, yeah. So, um, looking at the composition of impact melts can sometimes reveal the origin of the projectile. So is that um, the motivation for going back to the moon for maybe looking at, you know, SPA impact melt to see if it has uh, traces of Hungarian? Absolutely. I mean, well, let me put it a different way, right? Is that if you have, the more information we have on the projectiles that formed all the basins, the more we can try to constrain these models. I'm making predictions, but even then, my, pop, my suggested population is down by a factor of a thousand. So I don't know what was there before. So maybe I can fit anything that way, you know, who knows? But more information is better. And if we get, really knock that down, we can say more things because our understanding of the asteroid belt and the rest keeps getting more sophisticated. So um, when you were, hi. Oh, you're over there, okay. Yeah. So When you were uh, describing the Nice model trying to get out of basic assumptions, I had a thought which is uh, a basic assumption that we all have of the solar system formation is that you know we have the four terrestrial planets and the four gas giants and all the other stuff. And uh, I've been reading a lot about rogue planets and the frequency of rogue planet <laughs> formation. So have you considered modeling five or six gas giant sized things, some of them flying out. It's really funny you say this, because we, uh, we're, we're actually doing that right now. 
And it's just, I mean, like literally I, I had to give a progress report as part of being a director of this institute. And we have, a, we, we, the, the runs are being done right now, but um, given I'm being recorded, I don't know how much I'll say, but it's, it, but it looks, but, but look at this way. It, it's, um, it could be that our, that our system of planets may have started with more planets than we have today. We may have lost one. We may need to lose one to make everything work. But that may be okay given how many rogue planets are flying around. That may be the easiest way to explain some of these things. So when I'm off camera, come talk to me. I'll tell you more. So I have to be careful, right? You know, so. Bill, let, let me follow up on the, the question about conditions on Earth in this extended late bombardment. Yes. I think what you will find is there's lots of data on the Earth. Absolutely. On the oceans, on the life that was formed, on the continents that is relevant. We have all, until now, we've had this great convenience that the late heavy bombardment took place at a time when we have almost no sediments on Earth, almost no evidence to compare with. So it was very nice. Big bad things could happen and we don't have the data. Now you're pushing it into a place where we do have data. Absolutely. This is, I mean, one of the things, I mean, if anything good comes out of this, let's say this, everything I've said is wrong. If anything good comes out of it, is that we'll have people looking at the Archean in terms of thinking about impacts. Because right now, it's literally just a few people that do this. You know, I mean, you, you had Don Lowe give a talk, it's Bruce Simonson, it's Byerly. And we need more people looking at this and getting us constraints. And also what we need to do is be rethinking some of our astrobiology models because almost all the models I've seen in the literature have assumed that there's no impacts because they all ended 3.8 billion years ago. Impacts are never considered as a possible alternative to explain some of the things. And I don't have the expertise to do that, but some people in the room probably do. And I'd like to see what they come up with. There's no place, better place to look at the Archean than Australia, of course. Um, <laughs> are, are you inviting me? Uh, yes, yes, okay. Um, so Bill, um, as a memento of your uh, fantastic oh. talk, we have a uh, Thank you. SETI uh, mug for you, antique SETI mug. Not quite uh, late heavy bombardment time, but uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty old, so. Um, <laughs> so uh, please join me in uh, thanking Bill. Thank you very much.